Can I start with TED? <laughs> sure. What did you take away from your time at TED that has most influenced your thinking on media? So it's a, it's a really good question. And first, um, I think you did a great job framing it up, uh, Steffi, the way that uh, Darren and I worked together at TED, you can think of us as leading media. I led sort of the startup phase when we got TED Talks online, and Darren led the, the second phase, the scale-up phase, when it went out to uh, 100 million views a month. And when I look back and what I took at it, I think the thing that I learned from TED and took forward is the way that TED became TED wasn't just a conference, and it wasn't just video or just media, that TED over time really became an ecosystem, and it became an ecosystem for surfacing and sharing ideas. And that ecosystem, I, I thought so much over the years about what drove it, and it's all driven by essentially volunteers. Speakers come to TED and speak for free because they have an idea and they see a way of getting it out. Um, all around the world, there are TEDx events that are held, and they're held because there's someone in a city somewhere who wants to bring together people to share ideas. And then there are uh, translators. There's a whole army of 20,000 volunteer translators around the world who take those talks, subtitle them, and bring them out. And everybody does that for free. And what I really took from it is thinking about the power of that participation. If you can understand what makes people tick? What do they want to do? What are, what are, what are their urges in life? What are, what, are the, what, what are they trying to drive forward? And you can harness that. You can create something really powerful together. So I think that power of participation and the power of the ecosystem is the main thing I took from the years at TED and that we're taking forward. What, what about yeah, you? and I think, I think for me, um, what was so exciting is to think about the talk, not as the, the end user experience, but how do you take that, that core piece of content and reshape it and reconfigure it in all different ways. And so a lot of the growth that we saw at TED over the last five years um, to get to that 100 million a month was re repackaging the talk. And so what is, what is the audio from TED? What can that be? And of course, that became the TED Radio Hour and defined an entirely new format. Uh, now people are discovering TED because of the, because of the radio show. Um, and we learned what was so fascinating in Asia, we learned that the vast majority of um, ways that people would consume talks was an English language learning experience. And so we leaned into that and created an entire distribution network around using TED Talks for language learning, which is another effective way to spread ideas. And so and much of these ideas of taking a base piece of content and then reconfiguring it in multiple ways to see that, that, um, that uh, J-curve uh, are the ways that we think about, uh, in the, the ways we think about media in the context of our new initiative. I think you really um, invented a new media format. And you're, you're, change, you're changed the perception of how we consume media. What's next? What is the next, what excites about you, what is exciting about your new project, there? <laughs> well, so we, um, it's, it's interesting. We, we think of media um, very differently. Uh, and we think of content itself as the platform. So rather than um, building a site and expending all the resources to try to try, drive traffic to a location where it can be monetized, the shows that we are uh, putting out to the world as a content incubator are designed from the get-go to live in five or six different platforms from the very beginning and to be full editorial experiences. And so as in a media environment that's completely fragmented, um, because we don't have a website where we're competing against others, we're, that allows us to actually partner. And so this new show that we launched last week called Masters of Scale, and we'll play a um, a clip of that in a moment. It's, it's now the number one business podcast in the world. Um, Say it again. It's called Masters of... No, no, it's now the number... Number one business podcast in the world. Within a week. Number one business podcast in a week. <laughs> this is really a heavy clap. <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? That's the power of, wait, what? The power of June and Darren. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's, so it's, it, what's, what's been fun about it is that um, it, it, you know, the, the base form is a podcast, uh, but we formed a partnership, for example, with Entrepreneur, and so Entrepreneur Magazine is um, taking the base content and attaching articles and videos to every episode, so there's a full editorial um, experience that's surrounding each episode on entrepreneur.com and in their print magazine. And we have a partnership with LinkedIn around it where there's, a, there's an influencer program built around each episode. So we think of, it's, it's a little bit like a TEDx model where we think of the content itself as a building block for, for, for content to be created around, around it. I think you created a real ecosystem. It's kind of an ecosystem, isn't it, June? I think it is, and just, so just to build on what Darren said, I think in, in, launching, in launching Wait What, which is the, the name of our new content incubator, we think a lot about 
Just what Darren said, that with each property we put out into the world, starting with Masters of Scale, this podcast, we think about the ecosystem. We think about not just what do we want to say in this podcast, but who else can we bring to that? Or who are the other uh, building blocks? Who are the other partners we can bring? Um, and stepping back from that, um, it's been really interesting to watch it. I think in a moment, and I just want to cue the AV team, we'll probably move to the, the clips shortly from the, the audio clip. Um, but in each thing, one of the things that, that really drives us is that we also love to create things that define new genres. So rather than looking at what's really uh, uh, working and taking off and trying to imitate that, we think, where's the white space? What can we create with content that creates a new format, that surprises people, that gives people a new way of, um, of expressing? And so each of the new um, content properties we're launching have that quality to it, that it, they sort of define new genres. And that might be a, a good lead in um, to maybe uh, prepare the audio clip, and maybe Darren, you can talk a bit about that, yeah. about the Masters of Scale clip. Sure. So, so the f can we have the audio clip? Yeah, let's not play just the second, but yeah. if we could bring up maybe the Masters of Scale artwork, and then um, I'll just set up uh, this clip. So what you're going to hear is a clip from next week's episode, which is called Beauty of a Bad Idea. And so this is a podcast, uh, primarily distribution, of course, on iTunes. And business podcasts have historically done, done very well. Um, but because we think, we think of ourselves as, as inventors and storytellers, we, we're aiming at trying to, um, we're, we're, we're aiming our format innovation at emotional qualities mm -hmm. and contagious emotional qualities. And so um, what, we, what you'll hear in, this, in, in Masters of Scale is that we've composed or scored original music to, to every episode. And that's done in a very purposeful way to create a deeper connection with the content and, and, and make taking in the experience much easier. And so the, the episodes are scored and composed to original music. And we've also, uh, we're testing a, a concept that we call the peanut gallery, <laughs> where um, you'll hear just occasionally a, a comment from, from somebody that would be like in the, in, the, in the grandstands that's commenting on what's being said. And it creates these light, fun moments that, um, that really make the content very consumable. So uh, we're going to play um, the open uh, for next week's episode. I have been turned down 148 times. That's Catherine Minshew, co-founder and CEO of The Muse, a career development website that she pitched to investors 148 times. Not that she was counting. There were literally days where I had a no over breakfast, no. a no over a 10.30 no. a.m. coffee. No. No. A no over lunch, you know, disinterest at 2 p.m., um, somebody who left a meeting early at 4, and then I would go to drinks and feel like I was being laughed out of the room. And when we finally raised uh, our seed round, I went back and counted. It was both painful and gratifying at the same time, looking at all those names and thinking, I remember that no, I remember that no, I remember that no, and they sting. Everyone stings. Today, the Muse serves users in the millions. Catherine raised $16 million last year, and her tale is the origin story of most great startups. So if you're hearing a chorus of no's, you should look for other signs that you're onto something. I believe that the best ideas often appear laughable at first glance. You gotta have incredible talent at every position. It's like this huge push. There are fires burning when you're going home. Can you believe it? You're such an idiot. And then you go back to, this is totally gonna be amazing. There we can, so we can write that. Okay. Thank you. I'm supposed to know what to do. I have no idea what to do. Sorry, we made a mistake. But you have to time it right. Oops. Thank you. Have a three Thank you. It's good. It just seems absolutely nutballs. Do you, want to, do you want to add some comments? We should talk about Reed's involvement and yeah, for quickly. sure. Yeah. So, um, so first of all, if you, if you were surprised and by what you heard and smiled and liked it, of course, we would love for you to go and um, subscribe and listen to Masters of Scale. You can find it on iTunes. And you can find us at Twitter at, at Masters of Scale. So the, um, the whole concept behind the show, there's two things I'd love to, to bring out there. One is how we tap Reed Hoffman. So Reed Hoffman is the host of the show. He's the co-founder of LinkedIn, a very successful, um, one of the most successful Silicon Valley investors. But the thing about Reed is that he is also a teacher. He, he wanted to be a philosophy professor when he grew up. He loves to advise and mentor. But mentoring one-on-one -on -one doesn't scale. And what we saw in him was this desire to teach that we thought would translate in this really wonderful and delightful 
way. Um, so we work side by side with him. Each of these episodes uh, uh, anchors in one pretty well-known, usually entrepreneur, with a lot of cameo appearances along the way. One of the things I think of is it's interesting about it and goes back to this idea of an ecosystem is that when you hear that story, I don't know about you, but I think about all the times I was told no <laughs> you know, in launching X or Y, because everybody has that story, the experience of trying to will something into an existence and being told no too early, no, not a good idea, no, you'll never make it, boy, you know, getting getting those no's. And what it makes you do is want to share your own story. And so that's one of the things that we are planning to tap into with this series, is not just having experts on it who are telling their own stories, but telling these stories in a way that is humble and funny and resonant, that makes other people want to share their own tales of scale. And that's really the way we're thinking, one of the ways we're thinking about the ecosystem on the bottom up side for, for masters of scale. So podcasting is one of your pillars. What else? So, um, so along with casting, right? One is is one part is casting. It's yeah. thinking about who has who has great ideas and and a generosity to them of of wanting to share it. Um, I'd say another pillar, and I don't know if you want to step in on this, Darren, is the is actually the is is the a the use of of surprise and delight and and music at times. Yeah, and we should talk about, so um, we should probably move to the next clip. But, right. um, but the idea is that uh, we are, um, as, as an incubator, we're developing properties. And again, they extend in all different kinds of medium. And po podcast is one. I think what, what would be fun to show is, is also some of the more cutting edge medium like, like VR. Yeah. So um, we can queue up, but hold for just a moment the, um, the video clip. So we'd love to share with you here a short clip of another uh, project we did at launch in January. It was actually the, the precursor to our company, something we took on before that. It is the first documentary series shot in virtual reality. It's called The Possible. Each episode takes you to the edge of a technological or scientific breakthrough. And we are drawn to new mediums. And what we, when we saw um, VR starting to um, take off, what we wanted to do is something really ambitious, something more ambitious than had been done before. And when you're working, of course, in VR in a new medium, you have to invent every step of the way. And so in this series, we had to invent with the crew uh, the camera rig that can shoot from the edge of space in the stratosphere. We had to invent a camera rig that could shoot in VR in a car going 280 miles an hour. But we also had to invent the, um, the business model. VR is very expensive. We had to find a way to keep our costs down and also support it. So we had a, a visionary sponsorship with GE. GE created a VR film that was released as a double feature with each episode of this series. We had to invent a distribution model because there just aren't a lot of viewers in VR right now. And so we had a partnership with Mashable. And so we're just going to show you a short clip from our an episode. It's the, an, the inventor of the world's first hoverboard. Of course, it's really filmed to be seen in VR in a headset where you can look around but this will give you a snapshot of it. And we can play that video clip. It feels magical, intuitive, and it feels like you have superpowers. The thing I'm always thinking, how far can I push this thing? What's the craziest thing can we could do? What's the coolest thing we can do with that? What's the next thing that's gonna pop up? And with this kind of attitude in mind, you can achieve amazing things. When you, when you experience that in VR and you're actually on the board with him, flying, looking around, it is, it is an incredible um, experience. Thank you so much. I think it's, you all um, experience just in the moment the creation of a wonderful new media company. There are still new media companies to be founded, and I'm very happy that you're on such an early stage, but already a perfect stage, or already very elaborated stage here. If you would have a wish from the audience for your next future, what is your wish <laughs> for your company? Yeah, I mean, I think we... Um you know, it's funny, at, at, at TED, when we would hire, we would always say that um, a requirement is that we only work with nice people. And, um, and so we, um, we are creating content that we own, but that um, really meets our passion. Um, and, and finding partners that, um, that are incredibly creative, delightful people uh, that, um, that understand how to scale content uh, through partnership and collaboration. 
um, those are the kind of relationships that we, we aspire toward. We don't, um, because we're not um, building our own technical platform, that kind of um, collaboration to extend what we're creating uh, is really quite important. So nice people, what else, June? Well, just to build on what, was, what Darren was saying is um, everything we do, we're, we're, we think of media not just as media that we create for people to watch, but rather we think of content as a platform for other people to build on. And that takes two forms, and it's funny because Darren and I both think about it in complementary ways. I tend to think about how people can build with us bottom up. You know, what can individuals do? How can individuals participate? Um, what, what tales of scale do people want to build? What communities of individuals can we tap into? So, um, and whereas Darren thinks about it on the partnership side and the media companies, and so I'm going to make a note, but then, and possibly toss it back to you, Darren. This is that we are, are hoping to find the ways, to, f to find the things that people naturally want to do, that, that the stories that they naturally want to tell, the ways they naturally want to connect with others, to tap into that and, and harness it. And so for communities of people, for those of you who have, whether it's organizations or communities, that can be, that can be, that can be harnessed for their, their creativity and their generosity. Those are some of the partnerships we're looking for. And do you have any thoughts I think on you that? said it. <laughs> and I, I really tell you, if 11 years ago, someone would have told me that just to put talks on the internet and spread it, it's a nice idea. But what came out of this idea? And we are in the same moment at like 2006. I'm sure your company will be amazing world hit. Ask me in 10 years <laughs> on this. Hopefully five. Five in next like two years. But in 10 years we are talking, what's next? <laughs> so wait what? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.